About 25 years ago, the writer became interested in collecting and preserving some of these early models. Today, there are more than 100 old projectors which have come from all over the world. There are many important machines which I have been unable to locate, but I am still searching and someday hope to add them to my collection. Before the turn of the century, a complete performance usually consisted of several short films, each approximately 40 feet in length. These were single scenes, such as Empire State Express going 60 miles per hour, or a scene of President McKinley's inauguration. An original poster from 1897 announces the triumph of motion photography. During the latter part of the 19th century, the traveling exhibitor with his magic lantern supplied popular entertainment all over the country. Lectures on temperance, religion, and world travel illustrated by lantern slides were given in churches, rented schoolhouses, and town halls. This dissolving lantern, built in England about 1875, used limelight as a light source. The lecturer was also the operator. As he adjusted the light and changed the slides, he dramatically described the scenes to his audience. Early exhibitors tried many ingenious contraptions to create movement on their screens. Here, for instance, is what might happen to a man who imbibes in too much brew, or one who tries to rob a bird's nest. Howls of laughter resulted from such scenes as these. And for a more dramatic interlude, imagine a lonely graveyard on a sunny afternoon. As the sun sinks into the hills, the ghosts of our dear departed come back to haunt us. The skeletons dance to the strains of the church organ wafting over the evening breeze. But all too soon the night is o'er and the gray dawn seems to chase the dead back to their quiet repose. Such scenes thrilled thousands just before the gay 90s. But by 1890, photography was being wedded to the rapid exposure of a series of pictures to create the illusion of motion on a projection screen. An early camera built by Demony in France made a series of rapid exposures on a revolving glass plate. After the plate was developed and printed onto another similar one, the camera became a projector by the simple addition of a light source at its rear. The first motion picture film exhibition charging admission to the general public, opened in Paris, December 1895, using the Lumiere Cinematograph. This was really a combination camera, printer, and projector. The intermittent movement was of the claw type, and the film was perforated with only one sprocket hole on each side per frame of film. When used as a camera, 40 feet of film was fed from a small wooden magazine on top. After exposure, it was wound into this little metal magazine inside. No sprocket wheels were necessary for such short lengths of film. When used as a projector, a small spool holder was mounted on the top to feed the film. After projection, the film fell into a wooden box under the mechanism. An early Demony projector of about 1898 used the popular beater movement. This simple mechanism actually gave very satisfactory results and was widely used for some years to come. In fact, it was used as late as in 1915 in this country in the kinema color projector operating at 32 frames per second. This model of the Edison projector, which was sold outright to the exhibitor in 1898. It became known as the spool bank model inasmuch as the film, instead of being fed from a reel, was in a continuous loop. You will note that there were no upper or lower sprockets and no means for framing. Edison used a two-pin cam in his Geneva movement. It must be remembered that Edison's early films were photographed at 40 frames per second, and the two-pin cam allowed projection at this speed without undue wear on film or mechanism.
One of the earliest American projectors was the magnoscope built by Edwin Hill Amet of Waukegan, Illinois. It was exhibited by George K. Spoor playing one-night stands throughout the Middle West during 1896. The Colt Craterioscope of this same period, built in New York City, used a rear shutter and a 40-tooth intermittent sprocket. The sturdy movement in this projector reminds us of some of those used in some recent 16mm sprocket intermittent projectors. Another type of movement used about this time periodically gripped the film between two rubber rollers to bring the picture down one frame. Note that the gate tension is relieved during the period the film is moving in the gate. The upper sprocket acts as a stop after the film has been pulled down one frame. Framing is accomplished while running by turning the knob on the upper sprocket, thus moving the sprocket ahead or behind in relation to the rest of the mechanism. The Edison projecting kinetoscope of 1899 ran the film into a bag or basket underneath the mechanism. Up to this time, film magazines were not used on projectors. Instead, the reel, usually holding only a few hundred feet of film, was mounted on a so-called reel hanger above the mechanism. This also held a geared crank which enabled rewinding of the film between showings. The mechanism was mounted on a wooden front board and could be slid up and down for framing. Only the lens and aperture plate remaining stationary. Here is the Lubin projector of 1899, complete with limelight. We will tell you more about this light source later. Note the similarity of this mechanism to that of the Edison. One of the few changes is in the framing device. Here the aperture plate and lens moves up and down together. Lubin used a single pin cam in the Geneva. Another projector of this same period, as well as design, was the Powers Camera Graph. This machine was to be greatly improved and widely used for many years to come. Powers also used a single pin cam. Framing was accomplished, as in the Edison, by shifting the entire mechanism on the wooden front board. The Selig Poloscope was built by Andrew Schustek in Chicago for Colonel Selig. Copied in much detail from the improved Lumiere cinematograph, this projector used a claw movement. Note the crudely constructed screw for framing. Although these machines gave very steady pictures on the screen, they wore out very rapidly as the films were increased from 40 to 400 feet or more in length. Notice that the claw movement had six pull-down pins. Another claw movement projector, also manufactured in Chicago, was the Viascope, built by a man named Pink. In 1898, A.C. Roebuck of Sears and Roebuck designed a projection head to be used with a dissolving stereopticon, which had been sold by this firm for several years. This ingenious little mechanism, not much larger than your fist, 
gave very acceptable projection and probably more of them were sold than all other makes combined. The mechanism was mounted on sliding rods in front of the lower lantern and could be slid out of the way when projecting slides. It was known as the optograph and was actually the first model of the well-known motiograph which is still considered one of the finest projectors manufactured today. Just above the Geneva movement between the aperture and the lens was a barrel type shutter. Framing was accomplished by simply moving the aperture up and down. Because of its light weight, this machine became very popular with the traveling exhibitors in rural communities. Because of the lack of electricity in most of these one night stands, the limelight became the most popular type of light source. An intensely hot flame was directed against this stick of unslaked lime. The flame was produced by burning in proper combination oxygen and hydrogen gases. This little tank was known as the saturator and supplied the hydrogen gas by vaporizing sulfuric ether. Oxygen was generated in this larger tank where water came into contact with an oxygen chemical compound. Inspired perhaps by the popularity of the small sized optograph, Edison brought out the Edison Universal Projector in 1903, designed by A. White. This, the first all-metal machine to come from Edison, was also designed so that it could be slid to one side to project lantern slides. Most entertainments of this period still consisted of a lecture illustrated by slides and interspersed with short scenes on motion picture film. Incidentally, the sprockets, gears, and bearings of most of these early machines were made from brass. Edison still retained the two-pin cam in this intermittent movement. About 1903, Frank Cannock, who was employed as a projectionist in the Eden Musee in New York City, built this projector and named it the Cinematograph. Cannock had been a mechanic trained in the Singer Sewing Machine Factory in Scotland. The workmanship in this mechanism probably showed the greatest mechanical precision used in a projector up to this time. It was the forerunner of an improved machine which was later marketed as the Eden Graph and which still later developed into the first model of the simplex. This was, I believe, the first mechanism in which the Geneva movement was enclosed in an oil bath. Nicholas Powers brought out his first all-metal projector in 1905. It immediately became very popular and thousands were sold during the next five years. The Powers Camera Graph No. 5 had the first automatic fire shutter built in America, or so at least claimed the Nick Power Company. In 1907, Bell and Howell built the Kinodrome projector for Major Spoor. This was the first machine in which framing was accomplished by revolving the intermittent movement, as is done in most modern projectors. An innovation in this finely built mechanism were two front shutters revolving in opposite directions by using a shaft within a shaft, similar to the century projectors of today. The 1907 optograph number four used a relay condenser mounted on the gate. This model also had an arrangement for revolving the intermittent sprocket for framing. This was accomplished by sort of a sliding screw arrangement. The Sears Roebuck catalog listed as one of the features of this model its ability to be operated either forward or backward. 
Thus, short films could be made to run more than twice their original running time. Imagine the amusement of the audience at seeing horses going backward at full gallop, or divers springing out of the water feet first and alighting on the springboard. Thousands of other humorous happenings are all possible with the new Optograph. In 1908, the name of Optograph was dropped when a new model was introduced under the name of Motiograph No. 1. This was the first machine having all gears enclosed. By simply pressing a button on the crank handle, the film could be rewound back onto the upper reel ready for the next show. It must be remembered that an entire performance in those days consisted in most cases of only one reel of 1,000 feet in length. A double cone shutter mounted back of the lens and close to the aperture gave an improvement in shutter efficiency. The completely enclosed Geneva movement slid up and down to frame and was driven by a ball and socket shaft. This was the first movement that could be easily removed and replaced as a unit. This was also the first projector to use flange sprocket idlers, a common practice today. A motor attachment could also be supplied if desired. In 1908, Frank Cannock introduced the Eden Graph. The successful years of operation of his earlier model at the Eden Music had encouraged him to place this improved projector on the market. Although a finely designed and constructed machine, its success was short-lived. The industry wasn't ready to pay for the precision demanded by Cannock. It was to be three more years before his dream was to be realized when he and Edwin S. Porter designed the first simplex. Lubin's Marvel Cinegraph was introduced as their first all-metal mechanism. It had but few improvements over earlier models. The French Pathé Frères projector also enjoyed some success in this country during this period. It was considered a well-built and sturdy machine. The Powers No. 6 reached the market during 1909. This very ruggedly built projector was destined to become one of the most successful for many years to come. It was the first to revive the front revolving shutter, which was then used almost exclusively until about 1930 on all projectors. It introduced adjustable tension springs in the gate. However, the intermittent movement was the greatest innovation in this newest Powers projector. A five-to-one pin cross movement of entirely new design was used. It gave longer exposure without imposing undue strain on the film or the mechanism. Many old-timers today still wonder why this movement hasn't been revived in some modern projector. Instead of a pivoted idler roller on the top sprocket, there were two small rollers at a fixed distance from the sprocket similar to the design of many 16 millimeter projectors of today. A shoe was used on the lower sprocket instead of a roller. The pin cross movement was mounted inside the flywheel. A short time after the first of these machines were used in theaters and after many complaints from users, the Powers Company announced that due to the fact that the industry was changing over to the complete use of non-inflammable film, several elements in the design were found to be impractical and would be changed at no cost to the purchaser. The changes consisted of replacing the upper and lower idlers with a type formerly used, as well as enclosing the intermittent in an oil-tight casing. But it was more than 40 years later that the industry actually finally adopted non-flammable film. In 1910, the American Standard Projector reached the market and was quite popular for several years. In fact, it is claimed that for a short time there were more American standards in use in Broadway houses than any other make. In 1911, a new trend in projector design took place. The first simplex had arrived. 
This mechanism is so well known to the industry today that it is unnecessary to describe its many advantages over machines of the period. It was the first completely enclosed mechanism with center frame bearings. It had means for adjusting the revolving shutter during operation. A new style of sliding gate instead of the former hinge types. A new fire shutter and governor and a precision focusing and lens mount adjustment. The Edison Model D was a modernization of their old design by adding a front shutter and a semi-enclosure of the gears. This model used flange sprockets and was, I think, the first mechanism to use side guides for the film passing through the gate. Moshegraph brought out its 1A model in 1913, having a front shutter and double flywheels and other improvements. This same year announced the Baird projector, manufactured in New York City. This machine was closer to the general appearance of a 1956 projector than all others at that time. It had the first lamp house of generous proportions such as we presently use. A heavy iron pedestal, 3,000 foot magazines of heavy construction, and this mechanism designed with an attempt at simplicity of gearing and construction. This is the 1912 model German Erneman. Here some attempt was made at having a centralized oiling point. As in all foreign projectors, the film side of the mechanism was in the open, and 32 tooth feed and take-up sprockets were used. When using short focus lenses, they could easily be moved out of the way to open the gate. The English cam projector with its front barrel shutter was also of an unusual design as compared with American projectors of that day. The Kinemacolor projector of 1913 reverted to the then seldom used Demony beater movement. The color wheel behind the aperture projected alternate frames through red and green filters at the rate of about 32 frames per second. The result on the screen was really the first semi-successful presentation of actual color motion picture photography. These projectors were of course used with road shows rather than permanently installed, although they would project standard black and white prints by removing the revolving color filters. Here is a stranger. I don't know who designed or manufactured this machine, but believe it to have been built about 1920. It was probably the first 35 millimeter projector to use the curved gate. Instead of fixed tension springs, two endless spring belts held the film flat over the aperture. In 1921, Moshegraph brought out the Model F. By this time, all American projectors had enclosed mechanisms, center frame bearings, and front revolving shutters. Even the Nicholas Powers Company designed its number seven camera graph with completely enclosed mechanism. However, before this machine was placed on the market, the old Nick Powers Company was merged with International Projector Corporation. of talking pictures, the powers mechanism quietly disappeared from the field. Perhaps the greatest single improvement in projector design during the 1920s came from Germany. In 1925, the German AEG projector introduced the conical rear shutter. This shutter made possible the greatest light efficiency coupled with the utmost heat elimination. It was a forerunner of the shutters found in the most modern projectors of today.
In 1928, Moshe Graf equipped its machines with rear cylindrical shutters. With the introduction of sound on film, the reduced picture aperture size plus the perforated sound screens made an increase in arc amperage necessary. Rear shutters became very desirable. This one, designed by Basson and Stern, reduced the heat on the film as well as supplied a stream of cool air around the aperture. The Super Simplex of 1930 was designed with a rear disc shutter. This model could also be supplied with a turret to hold three lenses. By changing lenses during projection, the screen could suddenly be enlarged for spectacular sequences of the picture. We have seen many of the early projector mechanisms developed during the first 35 years of our industry. But there were 25 more years of development and expert engineering before we had the excellent American projectors of today with their efficient optical systems, foolproof automatically lubricated mechanisms, film take-ups which provide uniform tension of seven to eight ounces, whether using a two inch hub or taking up a 5,000 foot reel of film. Conical rear shutters operating less than an inch from the film aperture, water-cooled aperture plates, and of great importance, the recently introduced curved gate, which gives the utmost in sharpness of the picture on the screen. It greatly reduces buckling and damage to the film image, which has proven so troublesome since the introduction of the various widescreen techniques. Yes, we've come a long way from the 